Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so for the next 15 minutes or so, I'll be talking about some of the efforts in um, EFES, morphology, and modeling uh, that we're doing in terms of uh, cell typing, in, a, uh, in essence. And this is work together with a Blue Brain project. So I'll, I'll go into details later, just to set the record straight, we are collaborating uh, with our European uh, colleagues. Um, so um, uh, Jane alluded to our new building in Seattle, so I wanted to show you that. We are very grateful to our donors for actually um, building up and uh, being able to uh, work in there every day. Um, and so now uh, more into the science part, um, as, as, as it was alluded uh, in the previous talks, we, you know, we, we are very much into the cell typing business. Um, but once we start working on that, we, we need to be constantly reminded about how difficult it is to do cell typing in, in a meaningful way. And, and the reason that this is hard is because um, brain matter is very complex. And I think, so I'm showing you here, uh, this is from Stephen uh, Smith's uh, work at the Allen Institute. Uh, this is a, a technique called array tomography, where basically one can see um, all the receptors and all the different morphologies of, of it in, in, in a, piece, a small piece of brain matter. Um, so, but when we're thinking about this kind of complexity, uh, now, uh, the effort is to basically come up with a rule, come up with a set of rules that says, you know, how the different components uh, instantiate themselves and that how they combine to form circuits and in the long haul hopefully be able to say something about higher level functions in the brain based on these components and circuits. Now, of course, brain matter is extremely complex as we see it here, but there are uh, examples uh, out there where we have been able to uh, produce cell type libraries that are very accurate, very meaningful. One of those examples, probably the only one uh, for, with regards to, uh, to CNS, is retina. Right? So in the retina, we know exactly the number of cell types. We know exactly the number of you know, different cells that bring together the circuits. To some extent, we have a high high understanding or high level of accuracy in terms of uh, predicting what circuits do. Uh, this is not to say that the retina is a boring system, it's a very interesting system, but this, it is an example we, where we know what cell types, uh, how cell types come about and how they're formed. Now, in, with this example, um, the speaker before, well, she introduced this very well, we're trying to do the same way starting in cortex and of course expanding uh, to different areas. Uh, related to the visual pathway to some extent. Um, but so um, Basilica obviously talked about uh, the, the, this part, the, 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 the gene expression uh, part of the genotyping um, towards creating this data driven taxonomy of, of cell types, and, and Trickman did so too. I'm going to be focusing more on the EFIS and morphology uh, efforts at the institute to basically, as well as modeling, towards creating or informing that cell type taxonomy. Of course the idea is, and we are also working towards that end, to at some point hopefully be able to combine all these modalities in order to inform this taxonomy. Um, so, especially with EFIS, um, what, we're, what we are doing is we are working uh, with a wholesale uh, patching technique, basically, with brain slices. So in brain slices, you, cap, you, you cut the, the brain of, of, a, of a mouse, very thin slices, about 300 microns. Thick, you put them under a microscope, and now you're approaching the cell uh, with a pipette. You're penetrating its, its membrane, and you're, you're gaining access to the intracellular uh, space. At which point, one can do is inject different uh, parts of the different kind of current waveforms. So you see like very short pulses, you see ramps, you see DC steps or noise inputs, and the cell uh, offers an electrophysiology response in terms of spikes or depolarizations of the, of the membrane of the 
itself. Now, the assumption is, or in, in, in the past, it has been shown that the response to these kinds of, uh, to these kinds of electrical stimuli are characteristic, to some extent, of cell types. Now, this is one feature we're using now to enrich that cell type taxonomy that, 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 that we are um, working on, basically. Another feature that we, uh, we are interested in is morphology. Now, all of these cells, as you saw before, in the, from the area from other slide movie, um, had very distinct morphologies. Now, once we, so in that experimental workflow, now that we have interrogated electrophysiologically the cell, the next step is to fill that cell with biocytin, right? And then basically, we have an effort towards automated single neuron uh, morphological reconstruction, which means now we put that um, biocytin filled cell under the scope, and we have software running through these individual images we take from that cell in order to reconstruct their, the three-dimensional uh, morphology of its dendrites and axons. And uh, this software is actually being developed by one of our members at the Institute, um, basically, um, and, and has been published in the past. So this is Hanchuan's team that is working on this software. And, and it's actually Stacy Sorensen's team in, in, at, at the Structural Science Department that is using this software to basically uh, reconstruct all these cells, or a small subset of the cells that we uh, electrophysiologically interrogate. Now, so at this point, we have two data modalities. We have ethos and we have morphologies. And the question is, what do we do then, right? And th the third step in this process, or this workflow, is to create models, uh, or you know, try to create models and develop models, computational models, that basically capture these ethos and these morphological uh, features. Now, at the Institute, we, we are working uh, with, or we're developing a whole host of different models. Some of them are more abstract, called uh, leaky or fire or generalized GLIFs. Um, on the left, this is uh, Stefan Michalis' group. On the right, uh, these are the biophysically detailed models, and I'm sure that people that you know, are working at the HTP or with Henry Steven the Blue Brain Project know some of these models and the kind of uh, power they can offer. Um, basically, so these models we are also producing, and this is an effort uh, basically led by Anton Arkhipov and Nathan Gowans. Um, Myself, I'm also working towards developing these models in collaboration with the Blue Brain Project. And the reason, and so basically my, my, the, the, the remainder of my talk is gonna be focusing on these types of detailed biophysical models based on data that we collected at the Institute. And so basically, um, the workflow looks as follows. So we do all the experiments in Seattle, uh, we uh, eat these experiments, and then we get, we get we reconstruct the morphology also in Seattle. So now we have the two data modalities, and what then happens is we upload this data on a server, on a server that actually Werner from uh, Blue Brain Project on High uh, has access to, who downloads all this data, right, and now can use methods developed largely by Gottsegger's group, but also the Blue Brain to uh, basically use and, and, and develop these uh, biophysically detailed models. And the, so with regards to the optimization, um, basically these are the individual steps that we're going through. Uh, first, we're analyzing the e phase responses in terms of, and I'll go into that in terms of the features of the e phase responses. Uh, we are uh, using these e phase procedures uh, features, we are going into the main optimization um, procedure, which is basically a um, genetic optimization type. Um, we are creating a, a, a small number of models that replicate, to some extent, uh, inference responses given a, cer a, a cer certain morphology. And in the final step of this step, so in this process, we are picking the best model to basically be the most representative one for the data set, for the given experiment, the given data set. 
Um, now, with regards to what we're doing exactly, what kind of models these are, these biophysically detailed models, in effect, what we're doing is we are defining all these different conductances for uh, different types of, of cells. And basically, the job of the optimization is to distribute these conductances spatially along the morphology. That's what the optimization does. It doesn't play with the kinetics of, 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 the, of these uh, conductances. It doesn't, it assumes, them, it assumes them frozen. It doesn't change the morphology at any step. The, the job is to distribute as good as possible, as well as possible, these conductors along the morphology in order to get an EFIS response, which is the closest to these, uh, to the experimental one. Um, and basically, how do we assess uh, goodness of fit? Is basically uh, using these different features of the EFIS response. So basically, given a, a spiking here, in this case response, we have defined 11 features that we want to replicate as best as possible with our models. And every time, uh, and, or the optimization process, what it does is try to capture these individual features as close as possible compared to the, to the experimental data set. Um, so the, and the, right now, so this is something that started a year, year and a half ago. Um, at this point, we have 61 biophysically all active models. So these are the most complex models uh, that you can basically get, and they are extremely expensive computationally to optimize. Uh, and basically, uh, we, in order to develop them, we are using a lot of the blue brain infrastructure uh, in Switzerland, a lot of the methods developed there, as well as the supercomputer. Uh, because the, these kinds of optimizations, because they are so expensive, they, 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 they demand a big computer or a big infrastructure, uh, which right now at the island we don't have yet. Um, so I'm just going to give you one example. So here is a reconstructed morphology of a layer 5 parameter cell. And in green, you can see the basal dendrites. Purple, you can see the apical dendrites, and here on the left side, you can see in red the experimental response in a particular experiment of this particular of this particular uh, cell to a stereotype input, and in blue you can see how the model captures or basically uh, the developed model basically captures the interest responses, and as you can see, there is certain. Um, for example, responses that are extremely close to the experiment, and there is others, of course, like here, which are not so close. So this is something we are working on, um, but at this point, we have created a workflow that we are looking forward to uh, basically generate more and more of these single neuron models. And the question, of course, is, so this is basically the data, the EFIS responses in red, that we train the model or we, we used to basically train a model in order to develop it, right? And then the second step, what we do then is take this model and basically interrogate it with this noise stimuli, which haven't been used to develop these models. So in essence, what we see here is a response of the model in comparison to experiments that basically it has it not been used uh, to optimize it. And as you can see, this particular case does a pretty good job. Again, there are inconsistencies. But um, all, all in all, I think we're getting a robust response. Um, so the question is that, okay, you create all these single neuron models, and of course you can, um, there is the cell typing uh, aspect of it, but then at the end of the day, what are we doing with all these models? And um, what I'm not going to be talking about is some of the modeling effort at the Allen, as, as discussed, this is more of a, of a vignette uh, project where scientists that now can put together, using the single neuron models, a whole cortical column together, from example, for example, from mass B1, connect these cells up, these are individual models, right, uh, of individual cells, connect them up and try to see uh, which aspects of, of mass, for example, signals, such as, for example, extracellular recordings, 2P calcium imaging, EEG, uh, 
a whole host of, of observables, can we replicate using these models, these, these circuit models now? So this is how we go from individual components to whole circuits. Um, and so in this final 30 seconds, I want to uh, share with you some of the latest uh, projects that we, we are working on. So, um, of course, cell typing is very interesting, but what, what we, as of lately, we've gotten more interested in trying to figure out how we can uh, understand some of the pathological functioning of the brain. At the end of the day, it's also cell types. It's just uh, that, that give rise to circuit uh, function uh, or dysfunction, if you wish. And we'd like, we're getting more and more uh, interested in uh, using the same kind of approach of ethers, patching, morphological reconstruction of now uh, pathological activity um, in, the, in the brain of a mouse. And for example, here I'm showing you the kind of activity we're interested in our electric seizures, right? So we have our brain observatories, which we're not going to go into, but basically we use to monitor fluorescence. We use fluorescence imaging to try to monitor brain activity in the behaving mouse. And in this particular case, in the mouse had a seizure. While it was running, while it was getting all these visual inputs, you could see how it started at the, at, at, at the basically edge between S1 and M1. All of a sudden, you see this focus here spreading bilaterally. At the same time, you have this huge pupil dilation, which would be indicative of stage one seizure. Right? And the idea is that, okay, what happened in this case? Can we can we try to use all these models or these ethers to try to say something about not just uh, what happens during the function, but also dysfunction of the brain? And as uh, finally, as Jane alluded to, we have a current opening. So any interested uh, and very enthusiastic postdocs, uh, please apply. It's mainly a, a theoretical uh, position. Um, with this, I, I, I'd like to um, basically thank a, a, a small subset and a small group of people that very much contributed to us making those models. Uh, this is Werner, who's here, and Christian. Uh, Elif, who is uh, basically shadow uh, presence here, but it's a very much a big part of this effort. And it's very, uh, very important to point how, uh, it, you know, there, there was no other workflow uh, between, you know, the states and, and Switzerland a year ago, and these are actually the people that, or uh, the people that made this workflow happen so that we can have experiments on one side of the planet, and models of these experiments on the other side go hand in hand. Of course, Henry has been instrumental in all this and uh, giving us time with this, this beautiful uh, big machine of his. Um, of course, the data comes from a huge group of people. Uh, I believe this is still a subset of the people that work uh, on, the, on these data sets. And uh, of course, uh, none of all of this would have been possible without, uh, uh, without the funding and inspiration uh, from Paul Allen. And with that, I'd like to thank you.